When I was 19, I finally asked myself if I was gay, and the answer was terrifying. The only other people who'd grown up at my evangelical church in Kansas who'd come out had left. It was like they'd been erased from the community. In my church, as in so many others, being gay and Christian wasn't an option. But I couldn't give up on my faith. I didn't want to lose my family or church either. So I left school to study the central question so many gay Christians face. How could I reconcile my sexual orientation with what the Bible says about same-sex relations? This book answers that question. It's the culmination of four years of research, synthesizing for a popular audience the key insights of biblical scholars about the six references in scripture to same-sex behavior. It's also a personal story, describing how my study of those passages changed my dad's mind about same-sex relationships. And more than that, it's a blueprint for how other Christians can come to affirm same-sex marriage while also affirming their commitment to the full authority of the Bible. God and the Gay Christian is a book for gay Christians and their supporters who want to make a difference in the church. It's for their family members and other Christians who feel like they can't support LGBT people and stay true to the Bible. And it's for those outside the church who want to dialogue respectfully and persuasively with Christians who oppose marriage equality. At its core, this book is about building a future in which all Christians come to affirm their LGBT brothers and sisters and where no one ever has to have that realization be terrifying again. Welcome to In the Market with Janet Parshall. Well, I think you have a pretty good idea what we're going to be talking about this hour. That's Matthew Vines. We've listened to his sermon on this program. We've taken it apart. He examines what are often referred to as the, quote, clobber passages of Scripture, and then twists them and turns them, tortures them into trying to get us to believe, particularly those who are interested in stuff that tickles their ears, or those who are being taken captive by vain and hollow philosophies predicated on this world rather than on the Word of God, tries to woo people into the idea that being openly rebellious to what God says in His Word is somehow okay and justifiable. What's worse, his new book is published by a quote-unquote Christian publishing company. Well, is there an antithetical response to Matthew Vine's book, God and the Gay Christian? I think there is. And I think the book is called Can You Be Gay and Christian? Subtitled Responding with Love and Truth to Questions about Homosexuality. And that book is authored by Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown has his Ph.D. from New York University in Near Eastern Languages and Literature and is recognized as one of the leading Messianic Jewish scholars in the world today. He's the founder and president of FIRE School of Ministry. He has his own nationally syndicated radio program called The Line of Fire, and he's written over 20 books. In addition to that, He's a contributor to the Oxford Dictionary of the Jewish Religion and other scholarly publications. Now, I don't usually take the time to go that far into someone's curriculum vitae, but I did it in this case because I want you to view Dr. Brown as what I would call an expert witness on this. This isn't just some sort of off-the-cuff rebuttal. I'd be hard-pressed to tell you what Matthew Vine's requirements are or what his curriculum vitae says. But nonetheless, you can imagine any time you choose to challenge the word of God, you will be picked up and carried on the national news. Anyone who challenged the historicity of Jesus, the authority of scripture, trust me, no problem. You'll skyrocket to the top of the New York Times bestselling list. You'll get a place on CNN and eventually they might turn you into a special on the History Channel. But if you decide to adhere to the word of God, that's a whole nother story. Well, it is absolute truth, transcendent, immutable, unchangeable, applies to all people in all times and all places. Not quite as popular in the marketplace of ideas, but truth nonetheless. Dr. Brown, the warmest of welcomes. I've so been looking forward to this. First and foremost, I am stunned that a Christian, quote unquote, publishing company would release this. Their defense, of course, I'm summarizing in a sentence or two, is that it keeps the dialogue going. Well, that's one way to look at it. On the other hand, I could borrow from Martin Luther and say there are boars in the vineyards of the Lord. I'm concerned because this is the old lie from Genesis 3, hath God said. And if we don't know our Bible, we're going to be led astray. So what led you to write this book? Was this an important issue that you felt had to be addressed? Yeah, I, I felt it had to be addressed long before I had heard of Matthew Vines. And in fact, looking at what he had to say, it was it was really kind of more of the same, just packaged in a very nice and, and gentle way, which was no surprise in that regard. But it's the same thing, basically, starting with who I am, how I feel, and now coming to Scripture reading scripture through the lens of who I am rather than finding out who I am in God's sight through scripture. 
And I, I interacted with his book a little, but there wasn't a, a lot to, to interact with. I interacted rather with his, his, uh, his talk before his book was out. But this has been an issue I've looked at for years and, and years, Janet. And here's what folks need to realize. And biblical scholarship's my field. I've been living in this for over 40 years now. There is no new discovery. There's no new information. There, there's no archaeological, linguistic, textual data. Nothing. Nothing has changed except the counterculture revolution and the sexual revolution and the glorifying of all types of behavior and lifestyle. And now people are rereading scripture. There are interpretations that people have come up with that no one ever dreamed of for centuries, for millennia. And you have to wonder... What, pray tell, motivated these new interpretations and reading of the text? But at the same time, I'm sensitive to the fact that people struggle, that that there are issues that we hear from it constantly. Moms and dads, my kid just came out as gay. Pastors saying, hey, I have an issue. I don't know how to handle it. People calling my radio show and saying, I'm struggling. I want to serve the Lord. But, you know, does that mean I have to be celibate? So the church must address these things, both in terms of of theology and in terms of practical, compassionate ministry. And that's why I wrote the book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Yeah, excellent. So let me take those two areas, if I can, and let me delineate them out. And let's start first with the straight stick of truth. Before we get to what our response should be, let's find out what God's position is on this. So Matthew Vines and others like him, by the way, take these particular passages and then they try to twist them in a revisionist way. They don't look at them contextually. So the music is playing, Michael. Let me come back and let me just start first by taking a look at what Scripture says. Did God change his mind? Are we viewing this incorrectly? Uh, Is it the idea of a monogamous same-sex relationship? Does that somehow have scriptural approval? It's just being uh, promiscuous if you have a same-sex attraction that is anathema to the Word of God. Lots of questions here. I want to find out first what the Word says. Dr. Michael Brown is our guest. His book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, is the basis of our conversation. 1-877-548-3675. first two chapters of Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth, plants, animals, man, and everything in the earth. And he declares everything in creation to be either good or very good, except for one thing. In Genesis 2, verse 18, God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And yes, the suitable helper or partner that God makes for Adam is Eve, a woman. And a woman is a suitable partner for the vast majority of men, for straight men. But for gay men, that isn't the case. For them, a woman is not a suitable partner. And in all the ways that a woman is a suitable partner for straight men, for gay men, it's another gay man who's a suitable partner. And the same is true for lesbian women. For them, it is another lesbian woman who's a suitable partner. But the necessary consequence of the traditional teaching on homosexuality is that even though gay people have suitable partners, they must reject them. And they must live alone for their whole lives without a spouse or family of their own. We are now declaring good, the very first thing in scripture that God declared not good for the man to be forced to be alone. And the fruit that this teaching has borne has been deeply wounding and destructive. Matthew Vines, and this is part of the lecture that he gives on this subject, that the Bible is being misunderstood on the subject of homosexuality. Dr. Michael Brown has written the book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Not written specifically as a rebuttal, but philosophically, this is the sort of thing, more importantly, theologically, this is the response that he offers, or these kinds of posited ideas about what Scripture does and doesn't say. So, Dr. Brown, if I can, let me ask you first to respond to what he says. So he takes this, the creation, the distinction of male and female in the 
in the Garden of Eden. It talks about the fact that it's not good that man should be alone, and it follows suit, he is implying, that because God is good, it wouldn't be good that a person with same-sex orientation would have to be alone. That would then not be good because it's not good that someone be alone. How do we respond? Yeah, It's actually painful to hear that argument and even more painful to think that, that he actually believes that and that others actually believe it. The absurdity of it makes it all the more painful. So first, let's understand that the woman is called Isha in Hebrew because she's taken from the Ish, the man. So the way it's explained in Scripture, the woman uh, comes out of the man in a certain way, and the two come back together as male and female reuniting. When God created Adam, humankind, in Genesis 1, he creates Adam, male and female, and then gives the word, be fruitful and multiply. This is a word to the human race. Now, in order to fulfill that, you need a man and a woman. They are unique for each other in every way. When he makes the statement that exactly what a wife is to a husband or a husband is to a wife, that's what another man is to another gay man or another woman to another lesbian woman. Oh, there may be certain similarities, but of course it's not the same. There's the, the, the book series, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Well, Mars plus Venus is different than Mars plus Mars or Venus plus Venus. So the two now come back together as one. That's the union. That's the unique complementarity and the command to be fruitful and multiply, which was integral to marriage, integral to that union, can only be fulfilled through a male and female. That's why through all of the Bible, and I have a whole chapter on this, the Bible is a heterosexual book, through all of the Bible from beginning to end, it presupposes heterosexuality. That's the only norm. That's the only thing that God ordains or blesses in terms of relationships. And and even if you have, say, two gay men that care about each other and they want to serve the Lord, and they're trying to work these things out. I didn't write the passages, husbands love your wives, wives submit to your husbands. In other words, it's it's saying from the beginning, it's not just two humans. It's a husband and a wife. There is something unique about that. And rather than start with the six passages, the so-called clobber passages, we Mm -hmm. need to read the whole Bible and recognize that it's only forbidden in a few places because the opposite is what's presupposed from beginning to end. Let's also remember, as much as I have empathy for what Matthew's saying, and I've sat and listened to the stories, I've sat in tears as people told me their stories, I've read books just to break my heart with a burden so that I could understand what people are going through. And I try to convey that from the first page of my book, that you will put yourself in the shoes of someone who says, I'm same-sex attracted and I want to follow the Lord. But let's understand, we have brothers and sisters being killed for their faith. We have people being tortured for their faith. We have people who are living as widows, who are living as orphans because of the faithfulness of family members to the gospel. It's not always easy following Jesus. It's not, it's not about, I, this, I am alone and I hurt to be alone and God has to help me. I, I appreciate that appeal, but we are here to do the will of God. And if we will, instead of saying, I am gay, I am same-sex attracted, instead of saying that, say, I am here to serve you and please you. And there are plenty of people, you know them, I know them, plenty of people who are celibate and single and celibate and identifies homosexual who are serving the Lord, loving the Lord, blessed, and others who've really experienced transformation from homosexuality to heterosexuality. But either way, we deny ourselves and we follow Jesus regardless of cost or consequence, yeah. as yeah. opposed to creating a God who is here to make me happy. Amen. Wow. Such an important word. By the way, lest anyone think that you've written a clobber book, you have not. I want to read the dedication, Michael. You said, dedicated to all those who identify as LGBT or same-sex attracted and who desire to love and serve the Lord and to know the fullness of his love in Jesus. You know, if you love somebody, you say, you know, God really does have a better plan for you. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end therein is death. This is really about saying, look, it isn't a matter of saying, I hate you because of the choice you've made, but rather I love you so much. I want you to know the plan that God has for you. And there is a distinctive there. You write about this in the book, Michael, and I'd love for you to touch on it. And I don't think we have to stay here forever because if anyone who has some sense of the Old Testament and the New Testament figures this out. But very often that we make references to the Levitical passages. And you're right about this. This is one of your areas of expertise. What is that passage saying and how should or should not it be applied to this current cultural debate? Sure. You know, Janet, I find it interesting that when I talk about 
cultural issues, people say, well, you don't have a degree in that. I say, okay, I have a PhD in Semitic languages. Well, we're not going to listen to you about that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it's really very simple and clear. We'll make it clear to our listeners. Very simple and clear. The book of Leviticus deals primarily with ceremonial issues related to appropriate worship practices at the tabernacle. The various offerings and how to make them, clean versus unclean foods, diseases and bodily discharges, sexual taboos, and rules for the priests. Chapter 18 of Leviticus contains a list of sexual prohibitions, and chapter 20 follows this up with a list of punishments. In these chapters, male same-sex intercourse is prohibited and the punishment for violators is death. These specific verses are Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, 13. They read, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And 20, 13 goes on to say, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Well, there we have it. For many, the biblical debate is now over. It's surprising that so many people continue to believe that these verses in Leviticus somehow form the heart of the theological debate about homosexuality. They are, in fact, of secondary significance to the later passage by Paul in Romans 1. And the reason for that isn't that their meaning is unclear, but that their context within the Old Testament law makes them inapplicable to Christians. Much of the New Testament deals with the issue of the place of the old law in the emerging Christian church as Gentiles were being included for the very first time in what was formerly an exclusively Jewish faith. There arose ferocious debates and divisions among the early Jewish Christians about whether Gentile converts should have to follow the law, with its more than 600 rules. And in Acts chapter 15, we read how this debate was resolved. In the year 49 AD, early church leaders gathered at what came to be called the Council of Jerusalem, and they decided that the old law would not be binding on Gentile believers. The most culturally distinctive aspects of the old law were the Israelites' complex system, the Israelites' complex dietary code for keeping kosher, and the practice of male circumcision. But after the Council of Jerusalem's ruling, even those central parts of Israelite identity and culture no longer apply to Christians. Although it's a common argument today, there's no reason to think that these two verses from the old law in Leviticus would somehow have remained applicable to Christians even when other much more central parts of the law did not. This is part of Matthew Vine's traveling lecture. His lecture now has been turned into a book. It's been published and released by what has been, at least historically, a Christian publishing company. Dr. Michael Brown is with us. He's written the book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Responding with Love and Truth to Questions About Homosexuality. Dr. Brown, by the way, is the founder and president of Fire School of Ministry and hosts his own daily radio program called The Line of Fire. Uh, Michael, I'd love to get your response to what Michael Matthew Vines just said, because I just asked you about the Levitical passages, and in your book, you write about this. Yes, I have a whole chapter that deals with this, the meaning of toeva, abomination in Leviticus and how these things apply. In short, there were laws that God gave to Israel to keep them separate from the nations, like the dietary laws and other laws of ritual purity or mixing seeds in a field and things like that. Those were given to Israel to keep Israel separate from the nations. There were other laws that were universal moral prohibitions. For example, the prohibition against murder is for all people and goes back to Genesis, the ninth chapter. No one would argue that thou shalt not murder is, does not apply to believers today or Gentile believers. It's a universal prohibition. You say, yeah, but it's hard to figure out what's what. Oh, no, no, not really. On the one hand, you can ask, is it reinforced in the prophets and Psalms, Proverbs, and then in the New Testament? That would be one thing. Another thing, you could just look at the context in which it's given. So Leviticus 18, God tells Israel, do not walk in the statutes of the nations. Do not do what the pagans do. Do not do what the Egyptians and the Canaanites do. And God says, if you do, I will judge you the way I judge them. And then there's a long list, for example, incestuous relationships. On what basis would Matthew Vines and others say that incestuous relationships do not apply to it? If we don't get it from Leviticus 18, where do we, where do we get it? 
And then it it lists specifically homosexual practice. Out of all of the sins in the book of Leviticus, there's only one that is individually referred to as toevah, something detestable, which can be morally or ritually. In this case, it's, it's obviously both involved. And then at the end of the chapter, it says, don't walk in these toevot abominations, which include bestiality, which include homosexual practice, which include incest. Not my list, the list that God gave there. And, and again, this is a universal prohibition. This was a prohibition for all peoples. If God judged the pagan idol-worshipping Canaanites and Egyptians for these sins. Of course, he's telling Israel, I don't want you to do it. And significantly, in ancient Israel, this was so important that not only was it singled out as an abomination, but there was a death penalty associated. That's how it was in the theocracy in ancient Israel. If you look at violation of food laws, there's no death penalty or anything associated with it. And God says to Israel, when the laws are given, read Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, it says there, this is detestable for you. This is not a universal moral prohibition. This is detestable for you. What's fascinating, of course, the worst passage to pick was, was Acts 15, which Matthew picks, because what, what do the apostles and the leaders agree on? You should write to the Gentiles to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, from porneia. And you better believe 100% in, in that culture, in that context, it was as clear as day. Pornea, that is all sexual acts outside of wedlock. And there's only one wedlock that existed then, the union of a male and female. Acts 15 reinforces this very prohibition. Mm. Isn't it marvelous to have a wonderful Bible teacher that can say, all right, here's what the world is saying, but in contrast, here is what the Word is saying. And in the process of hearing that, I hope it helps us to be able and be more prepared to speak the truth in love. Much more with Dr. Michael Brown on his book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, right after this. The majority of references to sexual behavior in general and to heterosexual behavior in the Bible are negative. It's not because sexuality is a bad thing, because most of the references to it in scripture are to lust, to excess, to infidelity, promiscuity, rape, or violence. And yes, the Bible also contains positive affirmations of opposite sex relationships, in addition to hundreds of negative verses about forms of them. And it does not contain explicit positive statements about same-sex relationships. But it also hardly ever discusses same-sex behavior of any kind. And the very few references to it are in completely different contexts than loving relationships. In Genesis 19, there's a reference to threatened gang rape. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1, there's a reference to what appears to be sexual exploitation. In Romans 1, Paul refers to lustful same-sex behavior as part of an illustration of general sexual chaos and excess. And though he labels this behavior unnatural, he's using this term in the sense of uncustomary gender roles, just as he's referring to social custom when he labels long hair in men unnatural. The only place in scripture where male same-sex relations are actually prohibited in Leviticus comes in the context of an Old Testament law code that has never applied to Christians. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call eisegesis as opposed to exegesis. You're listening to In the Market with Janet Parshall. That's Matthew Vines. That's part of a traveling sermon that he's been giving, trying to unpack the scripture to support his idea that you can be an open, practicing homosexual and that it doesn't stand in contrast to the Word of God. Well, before that book was published by a historically Christian company, um, Dr. Michael Brown has been speaking about the culture and looking at the culture from a biblical biblical perspective. So he wrote the book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Responding with Love and Truth to Questions about Homosexuality. one 548 In the Market with JanetParshall.org is our website. Check out our question of the week. Check out our truth tool for a gift of any size to help support the work we're doing here on In the Market with Janet Parshall. Michael, uh, the 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 tortured 
eisegesis on this is amazing, and it also bespeaks, I think, a patent misunderstanding of the history of first century Rome as well. Would you respond to what he just said? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And again, I, I mean no insult to Matthew Vines or to those who like his book, but if you've ever been in school and someone scratches their fingernails on a chalkboard, just coming from a life of biblical scholarship and being in the text, it, it it's that kind of reaction I have when I hear the Bible being misrepresented, misused, and then that pain that people will be deceived by that. And, and really open themselves up to all kinds of other error. So let's, yes. let's unpack this. Romans, the first chapter, when Paul lays things out, he's, he's not talking about every individual today or in his day. He's talking about the descent of the human race. It's turning away from God and the process that happens. We turn away from him as, as a race, as a people. We worship created things instead of the creator. He gives us over to our foolishness, then to the lust of our flesh, then to things that are against the intended design, and on and on it goes. In the chapter, he uses the term males and females, which is unusual instead of men and women. It's not a common term that's used. Why does he use it? Because he's talking about the order of Genesis 1, God created male and female. You say, well, how do you know that? Because he uses explicit terms that if you were a Greek reader reading the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint, and that's what the Romans would have been reading, he uses mm-hmm. explicit terminology found in Genesis 1 in the Greek translation, and he quotes it in Romans 1 to say this this is exactly what we're talking about. A man being with a man or a woman being with a woman is contrary to nature, meaning contrary to God's created order. You know, I I found it funny, though, with the 1 Corinthians 11 reference. There was another author. Of course, he got a lot of attention, and he made the rounds on secular TV because he was also saying the Bible doesn't really say what it says. You know, Mm -hmm. just like if I came out with a new book, There Is No Hell, I'd be a celebrated author. I'd no longer be a bigoted (laughs) homophobe and a hater. I'd now be celebrated. You know, oh, you you know, whatever, as you said at the outset of the broadcast so eloquently. Well, this guy's trashing the idea of, you know, women have long hair and men have short hair. And, of course, he has short hair, and the girl interviewing him has long hair. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it was just kind of comical as this was going on. But Paul is laying that out according to God's created order in Romans 1. And it's very explicit when you look at the Greek of Romans 1, as Professor Robert Gagnon has pointed out, and then look at it in Genesis 1, the Greek translation. Wow. As for sexual exploitation, you, you know your position is in trouble when you're devoting your life, every, your, your, your eternal destiny, your soul, your future, you're devoting it to a certain interpretation, and you can only say seems, seems, seems to be talking about sexual exploitation. Why, pray tell, then the terms that are used in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, and the two of them, and then one of them repeated in 1 Timothy 1, why, pray tell, did every major lexicon, every major dictionary produced by secular scholars, liberal scholars, conservative scholars, every major lexicon of the New Testament Greek language and ancient Greek, they all understood this to be pertaining to homosexual acts, not specifically to prostitution or pederasty or anything like that. Why, pray tell, did it take quote, gay Christians and gay theologians to discover new meanings of these words. The other thing you have to ask is, okay, this would mean that until this new discovery, just in the last few years, because there were plenty of people wrestling with same-sex attraction for many, many generations and reading these same texts, why is it that God put things in the Bible in such a way as to give this massively misleading impression to thousands of years of same-sex attracted people who now lived under torment and wrong understanding and who were persecuted, misunderstood by the church and all the, all the sad stories we hear. And now it's just discovered now what the Bible really says now that we've discovered these new concepts called sexual orientation, which were also unknown throughout history. That seems a little suspicious. And how about just one one example, one positive example of of clear male-male love sanctioned by God in a a male-male marriage somewhere in the Bible? How about that to help people out? Obviously, mm-hmm. it's not there. You can't find it. I, I look at the whole David Jonathan thing and, and see clearly yes. that's not what's being talked about there either. It, it's a council of despair. And even mm-hmm. the quote you played earlier where he says, look, if I'm, I, I cannot be with a woman, I'm not attracted to a woman. OK, that's an issue. We want to reach out with compassion to someone like that in our in our church. But if it's a matter of whom I'm attracted to. 
and therefore God is obligated to give me a mate because it's not good that I'm alone. Where do we go with that? Uh, look, I'm not comparing two men who care about each other to, to a man who wants to be with a 12-year-old boy, but what if his only attractions are to 12-year-olds? You say, well, that's outrageous. Okay, exactly. In other words, the issue is not God's obligation to satisfy my want and my desire and my attraction. The issue is, God, you made me, you designed me for a purpose, and I want to serve mm-hmm. you. And a man is designed to be with a woman and a woman to be with a man. And no one would ever dream of anything other than that simply based on natural law. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Michael, you hear this all the time, as do I, and you address it in the book, for which I'm personally very grateful. Jesus was silent on the subject of homosexuality. Therefore, so should we. Yeah, well, what did Jesus say about wife beating, heroin shooting, bestiality? (laughs) What about UFO sightings? Or the Uh, use of electricity, exactly. Right. Now, Piers Morgan asked me that same question on his show last December when I was on in the midst of the Duck Dynasty controversy, and it was really like throwing me a slow curve because he asked me to give one example of Jesus addressing this. I said, well, I'll I'll give three. Let's first understand that from everything we know about Jewish ethics and morals in the first century, if there was a sin that was high on the list or a, a conduct that was high on the list of serious offenses, it was two men having sex. It was almost considered unheard of in Jewish circles because it was so so reprehensible. So that, again, is nothing that Jesus needs to major on or emphasize. That being said, in Matthew 5, he says he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. And then you see what he does with sexual ethics. For example, adultery. It's not just committing the act, it's committing the act in the heart. So he takes the sexual ethics of the Torah to a higher level. How much more the code of holiness in Leviticus 18 for all human beings. How about taking that further? That's number one. Number two, in Matthew 15, he says that all sexual acts outside of marriage, using the plural of the Greek porneia, all sexual acts outside of marriage defile the person and make them unclean. And then in Matthew 19, he reiterates God's purpose from the beginning in the midst of a a discussion about divorce. He reiterates God's purpose from the beginning is for the man and woman to come together and the two become one. What God's joined together, let no one put asunder. No one, no one doing God's will can pronounce two men joined together by God or two women joined together by God or now the, the latest thruples, three people joined together. No, no. You can't do that. You cannot pronounce God joining two men or two women together because he never did. He never intended that. Jesus reinforces that in Matthew 19. So aside from the argument from silence being very faulty and very yes. foolish, the fact is he addresses it in, in clear ways that would be so fundamental. Again, the idea that, that you're going to try to get him as an advocate for this. I even have a chapter dealing with one of the more bizarre interpretations, but many gay theologians advocate it, namely that when Jesus healed the servant of the centurion, that was the boy lover, the boy toy, basically, and, and mm-hmm. Jesus wanted them to keep on partying. And that's why he said, hey, if he's really important to you, you know, uh, he's healed. Go for it. And that was that. Mm-hmm. that's how crazy it has to get for you to have Jesus sanctioning same-sex practice. So here you have a man and, and his boy toy, and Jesus says, go for it. The woman in adultery, he forgives her and then says, go and sin no more. To these, he says, go keep partying. No, yeah, sir. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Michael Brown is with us. We've put his website on ours and also his book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? You can learn more about the excellent work Dr. Michael Brown does at In the Market with Janet Partial.org. In the Market with Janet Partial.org. Again, the book that Dr. Brown has written that speaks right to this subject, and you can hear first, last, and always his love and his knowledge of the scriptures, which is paramount for us as we contend for the faith, but also Heart of Compassion. It's a perfect representation of the best. Balance that must be ours, truth and love. Back after this. The Bible never directly addresses, and it certainly does not condemn loving committed same-sex relationships. There's no biblical teaching about sexual orientation, nor is there any call to lifelong celibacy for gay people. 
But the Bible does explicitly reject forced loneliness as God's will for human beings. Not just in the Old Testament, when God says that it is not good for the man to be alone, but in the New Testament as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes about marriage and celibacy. He was celibate himself, and he says that he wishes that everyone else could be celibate as well. But he says each person has their own gift. For Paul, celibacy is a spiritual gift, and one that he realizes that many Christians don't have. However, because many of them lack the gift of celibacy, Paul observes that sexual immorality is rampant. And so he prescribes marriage as a kind of remedy or protection against sexual sin for Christians who lack the gift of celibacy. It is better to marry than to burn with passion, he says. And today the vast majority of Christians do not sense either the gift of celibacy or the call to it. This is true for both straight and gay Christians. And so if the remedy against sexual sin for straight Christians is marriage, why should the remedy for gay Christians not be the same? Buyer beware. And this is Matthew Vines, again, traveling lecture that he's given in churches, by the way. And now this lecture has been turned into a book that has been published by a at least historically Christian publishing company. So now we're in the marketplace of ideas. And as you and I go, how do we learn to discern the false, the cheap, the shabby ideas from the ones that are bedrock solid biblical truth? Well, I praise God for Bible teachers like Dr. Michael Brown, who joins us. He's written over 25 books. He hosts his own national program, and he also is the president of Fire School of Ministry. And he's written the book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? And the subtitle, again, is worth saying, Responding with Love and Truth to Questions About Homosexuality. Michael, again, I would love for you to respond to what Matthew just said the first thing is marriage is the union of a man and woman even in different relationships that happened in scripture or things that at certain times were accepted or polygamous relationships or other things like that it always had the ingredient of a male and a female marriage is only that california assembly recently passed a bill with an overwhelming vote that lesbian women on birth certificates can de designate one of the women as the father, and, and homosexual men can designate one of the men as the mother. So you have male fathers and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> that's what you should have. You have male mothers, it's even hard to say, male mothers and female fathers. England recently said that we are now redefining things, overruling the Oxford English Dictionary and centuries of usage so that a husband can be a wife and mm -hmm. a wife can be a husband, and on and on. Uh, or a husband can be a woman, and so on. In other words, you, you have to completely trash the meaning of words. North becomes south, and, and, and down becomes up. Everything becomes meaningless. Marriage is only one thing in Scripture, the union of a man and woman, and what God ordains in Genesis 2, and celebrates in various passages, and lays out in Ephesians 5, in the image of Jesus and the church. It is a man and woman coming together. So, People have different attractions. People have different things they struggle with. But God does not redefine marriage and redefine morality based on that. And there have been fine Christians through the centuries that had same-sex attraction issues, and either God graced them with celibacy or graced them with a relationship with a spouse where they had companionship and intimacy, and whether it was full sexual expression or not, they were blessed. I don't mean to be insensitive with this, but this is not a new problem. The problem is now identifying this is who I am and God somehow must satisfy my desires. You could say, and I'd ask Matthew, listen, you've read the scripture carefully on this. Please show me somewhere where God just gives one positive example of what you're saying. What, because we have a whole Bible saying the opposite and clear passages that prohibit the behavior that you're speaking of as a violation of God's fundamental law for human beings. Look, there's something now called genetic sexual attraction, GSA, where it's been discovered that people who are of the same parents, so they're biologically connected, they may be separated early in life. When they meet, they have sometimes this overwhelming sense of sexual connection that would have been broken by being raised in a home together. What do we say about that? 
There are couples who are advocating the right, a brother and sister to marry. We are deeply in love and we're made for each other. We say uh, where hearts go out to you, but that's in violation of God's law and in violation of, of the laws of our nations. We do not rewrite scripture based on that. And, you know, the other thing that's being ignored is the voice of so many Christians who have struggled with same-sex attraction and are enjoying their relationship with the Lord without sexual acts with other people or who've been through transformation. And ultimately what Matthew's admitting here is it comes down to a matter of sex. Uh, That's ultimately what he's coming down to. We will rewrite the entire Bible. We will rewrite what God established as the order of male and female. We will rewrite the meaning of marriage. We will reinterpret the words of Moses, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul. We'll reinterpret all of that based on a desire to have sex. That's what it comes down to. Mm. So last question in an hour that's gone far too quickly, Michael. How does the church respond? That's almost a rhetorical question because of the winsomeness in which you've handled this conversation this hour. But are there any more directives you can give us so that we're we're going to be accused of being haters regardless? But how does the church respond? Well, obviously, if they get a copy of my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? I go through it in great detail. But let us ask God to break our heart for those struggling, to give us compassion, insight, so that we can have God's heart in reaching out. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much. Michael, what a superb conversation. And it's a tough topic, and quite honestly, it's one that's going to challenge the church, I think, even more intensely in the days ahead. So we need to be prepared. We need to know what we believe, why we believe it, and what the Word of God says. And out of love for other people, we share that truth. That really is the mandate, is it not? His love is meaningless without His law. His law means nothing if it weren't for His defining love. I want you to have this book, because every one of you is going to touch this subject somewhere in your life. So to the first 10 callers. I'm going to give you a copy of Can You Be Gay and Christian? 1 877 548 3675. 1 877 548 3675. I know it's a lot, but I want that many people and more to get a copy of Can You Be Gay and Christian? First 10 callers, we're going to give it to you. 1 877 548 3675. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Michael Brown. What eloquence. But that's what happens. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Michael knows the word, and you heard it this hour. We'll see you next time, friends.